Good morning. Um, I will be giving a, a presentation on uh, everything you need to know for, for submitting jobs on Theta. Uh, but the, seriously, though, this is intended to be a, a self-contained guide, a, a one-stop shop, if you will, for quick reference material for everything you need to know to you know, log into the machine, compiling your jobs, setting up the environment, submitting jobs, and debugging jobs. And, and throughout the slides, uh, I'll be pointing you to the documentation on the website, which will have a lot more information that you can go into. So this could be a, a handy resource to keep, in, to, to keep close by. Um, I'll first go over the Theta resource, the, the, the key machine that we're, many of us are here today to talk about and work on, uh, given a brief system overview, the, the software and environment modules, setting up your environment, picking your compiler, for example, uh, building your code, queuing and running jobs using the QSub and the app run commands. Uh, and then that'll be the bulk of the presentation. And then I'll, I'll say a, a few words on the Cooley resource, our data and visualization cluster. Uh, an x86 machine, and a, a quick system overview and, and uh, some hints on compiling and, and queuing jobs. Um, and, and then I'll, I'll conclude with a handful of tips that, for troubleshooting. Uh, we, we, I, I won't be saying very much about Mira today. Uh, I, I still include a photo. I, I, I'm sad to see it go at the end of the year. Uh, but if, if you do have any questions about Mira, many of you may still have active projects running on the machine and doing good science. Please do ask questions if you have questions regarding Mira. But, but the presentation today will be focused mostly on Theta. Uh, theta, uh, as many of you know, is our, our, one of our current production machines. Uh, it, it very much, uh, it was originally intended to serve as a bridge between Mira and Aurora, and, and that's still very true today. Uh, in particular with, with the, the class of simulation, data, and learning workflows. And so users today are, are, are standing their workflows up on Theta in preparation for the Aurora when it shows up in a couple of years. Uh, Theta is a Cray XC40 system running the Cray software stack. If, if you've logged into any recent Cray machine, the, the, the software environment will be very familiar. Um, it's a peak petaflop performance, double precision, uh, 11.69. And that comes from a total of 4,392 uh, nodes with the second generation Intel Xeon 5 processors, code named Knight's Landing. Uh, th this particular SKU of the KNL nodes has 64 cores uh, running at 1.3 gigahertz clock frequency. And in each of these cores, each of these 64 cores has four hardware threads. Um, a unique feature uh, of the KNL nodes here is that there's two types of memory that's accessible to your application. Uh, 192 gigs of DDR4, um, a big capacity, relatively slow memory and 16 gigabytes of MCD RAM memory, a, a, a smaller capacity, but much considerably faster. Um, and I'll say a, a few more words about that in a couple of slides. Um, additionally, on each node, uh, 128 gig SSD drive. And so for, for data-centric applications, this is particularly useful. Uh, or, and also for, for applications where, where checkpointing is a performance bottleneck, the, the SSDs can, can serve as a intermediary resource between that and the parallel file system. Uh, the Cray Aries high-speed interconnect is on the system in the Dragonfly topology. And, and Theta sits on top of a, a Luster file system, uh, 10 petabytes in capacity with a throughput of 210 gigabytes per second. A, a very quick overview of the system. Uh, from the bottom left is the, the individual socket, the, the K&L socket, where you have the, the 64 cores, the 192 gigs of DDR memory, and 16 gigs of, uh, of MCD RAM memory. Uh, four of those nodes fit into a blade, uh, 16 of those blades fit into a chassis, and then three of those chassis make up a rack. And in, in total, the, the, the Theta system comprises of 24 racks. Um, uh, for a couple of details on the network, uh, it, again, is the Dragonfly topology, and there are 12 groups uh, within this network, and at, with a 12 terabytes per second bisection bandwidth. Um, total on the machine, uh, the 70 terabytes of MCD RAM and, and 843 terabytes of DRAM. And so for, for applications, large machine learning applications where you have large data sets, really the, the, the DRAM and the SSDs are, are things to, to pay attention to, to look into for your particular application. And so now the memory, the memory hierarchy. Um, so Theta, the, the KNO nodes, there's two types of memory on the system, the, 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 the fast MCD RAM and the relatively slower DRAM memory. Um, a good default for, for making use of these two types of memories is, is to run in, in what is referred to as cache mode. 
Uh, and so that's where the, the MCD RAM serves as a, acts as a cache between the, the larger DRAM memory. Um, and so the, in general cases, this is a pretty good mode for, for your applications to run in. Um, if, if your memory footprint per node is relatively small, uh, less than 16 gigabytes, then uh, depending, on, again, on the application details, th there could be a performance improvement uh, running instead in flat mode where you specifically allocate out of the high bandwidth memory. Um, and so th those are two ways to, to make use of the machine without changes to your application. Although, uh, if you go in to make changes to your application by explicitly allocating memory to one or the other uh, devices, using, for example, the JE malloc or the memkind libraries, then you could make use of flat mode where allocating some arrays out of this DDR and, and some other arrays out of the smaller capacity high bandwidth memory. Uh, for example, if uh, arrays used for fast Fourier transforms, you, you would want to allocate those out of the high bandwidth memory. Uh, where other arrays that are not uh, utilizing uh, memory bandwidth limited kernels, you, you could safely allocate those out of the DDR, for example. Um, but generally, and I'll, I'll say this again later when uh, talking about scheduling jobs on the machine, the, the, the cache mode is a, a pretty good default for applications and workflows. Um, and then from there, you can maybe uh, squeeze out a few more percent improvement in the runtime, depending on, of course, on your application. Um, there's also a hybrid mode where, where part of the MCD RAM is, is partitioned off as a, an explicit device that you can allocate memory out of, and the other portion is, serves as a cache between the DDR. Um, uh, again, th this is a Cray machine, and so if, if you've logged into any recent Cray machine, the, the environment would seem very familiar. Uh, the programming languages, there's Fortran, C, C++, Python, uh, a number of distributed programming models, parallel uh, programming models, uh, MPI, uh, there's OpenMP on the system, uh, PGAS, uh, a, a typical Cray compiling environment. They have the Cray compilers, the GNU compilers. There's also third-party compilers available on the system. In this case, with uh, Theta, there, that's the Intel and the LLVM compilers. Uh, the debuggers that you're, uh, many of you are accustomed to, DDT, LGDB, uh, performance tools, uh, there's CrayPad on this system is, is a light, one of the uh, lightweight performance tools that are available for, from the Cray environment. Um, math libraries through the, the LibSide library, uh, Blast, Laypack, Sclaypack. Um, there's also a Petsy and Trilinos on the system and, and a, a version of, of FFTW that's provided. Um, and also for I.O., NetCDF and, and HDF5. Um, so no, no surprises. It, it, <clears throat> A lot of what you may be accustomed to is available through the Cray environment. In addition to that, uh, there are a number of non-system softwares and libraries that we have installed on this system. Uh, again, the, the Intel and the LLVM compilers are available. Uh, DDT is available as a, a full-scale full debugger on the system. Um, we have additional, m many of the, the tools and software libraries are available in slash soft and then in a descriptive project directory. So the compilers, the buggers, libraries, performance tools is where you, you will find Darshan, HPC Toolkit, Tau, uh, visualization where it was where you'll find Paraview, VTK, Visit, and some other libraries. Um, in addition, though, as, I, as I hinted to earlier, that you know, Theta very much is a stepping stone to Aurora in support of data and learning and, and simulation workflows and, and the convergence of all three. We, we do have a, a very large suite of, of machine learning, deep learning, uh, and, and workflow tools that you can find useful. Um, Intel optimized TensorFlow, uh, Keras, PyTorch are available on the system. Horovod is available on the system. Um, optimized performance libraries provided from Intel are available. Uh, Many of you here maybe use, uh, make use of MKL, the math kernel libraries. Uh, there's also MKL DNN, LibX SM for small matrix multiplies. Uh, for, for workflow and data analysis needs, uh, singularity containers are available. Uh, uh, Jupyter Hub is, is a system, is a service that, that is available on this system as well. Uh, MongoDB, uh, Balsam, for anyone that has workflow needs. Uh, Balsam is a, a very handy tool to be uh, accustomed with and to include. Uh, and so m many of these will, will be covered in some capacity throughout the, the workshop this week. And so I would encourage, if, if, if you notice anything that's of interest for your particular workflow on the system, to take a look through the agenda and to make sure to attend uh, those presentations or the related breakout sessions. Um, and also a, a couple variants of Python uh, provided with Intel's uh, Cray and also Anaconda distribution. For, for getting access to a lot of the compilers and the Cray environment, uh, 
the, the, the modules is the mechanism for doing so. Uh, and so modules is, is uh, one of the many tools that are available in the, the community for, for uh, managing a, a user's environment, setting up your path, for example, and your library paths. Um, in particular, th this will be, the, the, this is the main mechanism for changing your compiler. Uh, the default on the system is the Intel compiler, and so if, if you'd rather use the, the Cray, the LLVM, or the GNU compilers, the modules is the, the key mechanism for making that change. Um, a quick summary of, of the commands that I, I tend to use that, that, are general, that, that seem to be the, the, the useful ones to know. Uh, you can do module help to, to get a list of all available module commands. Uh, module list to, load the, to, to list the, the currently loaded modules in your environment. Um, if you ever run into issues uh, with, with your application, module list is a particularly handy piece of information to, to report to see what, what exactly is in your environment when that issue is encountered. Um, uh, listing all available modules on the system to, to dump out a full list of everything that's available, including the multiple versions and variants for, for different packages. Um, if to add a module to your environment, you can do module load, the, the name of the module. To remove a module from your environment, module remove, unload in the name of the module. Uh, for swapping modules, that one that may be loaded for one that's not loaded, and this would be a good example for the compiler, you could do module switch your old compiler, programming environment Intel, for example, and then the new module that you want loaded, mod programming environment GNU, programming environment LLVM, um, for example. Uh, and then to, to look at information for what the module is actually doing, how the module is modifying your environment, uh, you, you could do module show mod. And so I, I find that helpful to figure out where, where certain modules are installed, you know, which path, and so I can go look and grab headers, for example. Um, a, a few words on the compiler wrappers. Uh, again, I, I believe this is common for Cray systems, uh, but for, for all compilers, Intel, Cray, GNU, Clang, LLVM, sorry, uh, you know, you really want to use the, the CC, the lowercase CC, the uppercase CC, and the FTN wrappers. So the, depending on the compiler module loaded in your environment, these three wrappers will point to the respective compiler that you've loaded. And these really are the, the wrappers that you want to use for compiling applications in the, the theta cross-compile environment. Uh, do, do not use uh, the wrappers, you know, MPI, CC, MPI, F90, as, as they don't generate uh, code for the compute nodes. Uh, a good rule of thumb is most cases, if the code runs on the login node, it probably won't run on the compute node if it's doing anything performance critical. Um, so if, if you submit a job that doesn't run on the compute node, but then you do a test on the login node and it runs successfully, that, that's a cross-compiling issue, for example. Um, again, uh, as I said on the previous slide, you can use module swap, uh, module switch. Uh, to, to swap the compiler version or compiler versions or, or the compiler choice uh, between Intel, Cray, GNU, and Clang. Um, if, if you'd like to see what exactly the wrapper is doing, what, what include files is it, what include paths is it including, what library paths is it including, what other optimization flags may the, the wrapper be including, you can use the dash Cray PE verbose command. I, I find that helpful when I, I'm trying to figure out why certain math libraries are being pulled into my executable that I, what I didn't explicitly specify. Um, and so if you're, for example, if you're trying to link in, say, the MKL libraries, but you continually see the libsci libraries being linked in, you could look at the output from the Cray PE verbose command to see why those libsci libraries are being pulled in. Um, and if, if you chose to, uh, you could remove the automatic linking with libsci that the wrappers do, with module unload cray libsci. And so then you would have more explicit control of what's being linked in at that step. Um, um, so you, you've logged onto the machine, uh, you've, you've set up your environment, you, you've successfully compiled your code. If not, you, you may have submitted a ticket to support ALCF support to, to work through that compilation issue, but now your, your code is compiled and ready to go. And so we're ready to submit a job. Um, you know, one of the things that I, I would encourage doing every once in a while is to check, especially for, for workflows where you're generating lots of data, you know, high percentages of your total quota, for example, uh, is, is to occasionally check the available disk space that you have. It, it's really important to make sure that you, you do have enough disk space available in the project directory where, where all of your workflows should be, workloads should be running out of to, to ensure that all the output generated is, is, has a place to go and that the job doesn't get killed for for um, running out of the, exceeding the quota. Uh, so 
if, if, if you're having issues with your home directory, you can use the my quota command to see how much space you have available in your home directory where you may be compiling your application. Uh, for the project directory, you can use the my project quotas command, and so you'll get a nice summary of all the projects you're a member of and, and the, the utilization and the quotas. Uh, and, and really, again, the, the, the project directories, the ones that sit on the parallel file system, the Lustre file system, that, that's really the one you want to use for your production one. Um, uh, the, the, the other thing to, to keep an eye on is to make sure that you have enough core hours available for the, the jobs that you want to submit. Uh, and so the, the SBank command is one of the, the primary tools for getting access to that information. Uh, there, there's a large amount of, of information both in the man page for SBank and the, the ALCF website at the, uh, at the top of the slide, uh, where you can look at all of the avail available options and settings uh, to, to look at the information. Uh, Probably a, a good command to, to, to recognize would be the, the SBank LA uh, list allocations command and to provide it with dash P and then the name of your project. And so that'll give you a, a summary of what uh, resources are available for that project. Um, by, by default, it'll print the resources available on the machine that you're logged into. And so if you'd like to look at a summary of the resources available on all the machines for that project, you could then add the additional dash R and then all. For, for all resources, or you could do dash r theta for, for specifically the theta resources available. Um, that, that's explained in the man page. Uh, if, if you wanted to look at all of the charges uh, against the project by a particular user, uh, in most cases you'd only have access to your in particular your information. You could then add dash u, uh, and then user, to, to look at a, a list of, of, of the charges that you have made against that project. Uh, I'll, I'll mention it here, and, and I'll point this out again later. Uh, uh, charges on theta are, are based on a, a node count, or based on the number of nodes that are utilized for the job, irrespective of whether you use one core or all the cores on the node. Uh, so we encourage you to use all cores. Uh, but, but the jobs that, that are submitted to this, the default queue on theta that are smaller than 128 nodes, th those jobs will still get allocated a full set of 128 nodes. And so 128 nodes it represents the, the minimum allocable unit that, for the scheduler. And so if, if you submit a, a, a 32 node job for, for uh, short runtime testing, that, that short job will still be allocated 128 nodes. And so uh, in many cases that, that's acceptable because it's a small short job that you may be running for testing. If your workflow, on the other hand, consists of many of these 32 node jobs, for example, that are running for long times, it is really advantageous to, to bundle many of those jobs together to make use of the 128 nodes that are being allocated. I'll, I'll say a little bit more about this in a few slides when I talk about the scheduling, the, the queues. Um, the, the scheduler on Theta, as all of the ALCF machines, is Cobalt. Uh, the, the, the syntax, if, if, if anyone here is unfamiliar with it, is similar to the PBS style scripts. Uh, the, the, the website here has a, a number of examples that goes into details for the different options. Uh, some of the, the key commands are, are I think I, I've, I've listed there. Uh, you know, the primary one, submitting a job, you, you'll use the Q sub command to submit that. Uh, and on Theta, this will be primarily with a, a script that, that you'll submit your job. And so it'll be Q sub and then the, the name of the script. Uh, to the query, the, the status of a job that has been submitted, you can use Q stat. QStat will show everything that's available, in, everything in the, the queue at the time, uh, and you can pass options to QStat to, to parse that list further down. Uh, you can delete a job that you may have submitted on accident with QDelete, QDel. Uh, for a handful of job parameters, uh, you, you can alter the, the parameters of a job that has been submitted. Uh, maybe you've submitted a job for, for 12 hours, but it only really needs to run for a couple of hours. Uh, and so by reducing the wall time that you request, you can maybe improve the chances of your job running sooner. And so you could then use QAlter to, to reduce that wall time to something more appropriate for your job. Um, if if a, a very handy command, especially for today or this week during the workshop, is QMove. And so if, if you submit a job to one queue, but then you want to move it to a different queue, you can use the QMove command. And so uh, a common thing that occurs during the workshops is that by default, jobs will get submitted into the default queue, but that won't take advantage of the reservation that we've put in place for everyone to, to make use of during the, the workshop. 
And so you could then queue move your job from the default queue over into the, 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 the reservation that we have available for the workshop. So I, I would pay attention to this one if you notice that your job during the workshop is not starting right away. It, are, is your job in the right queue? Uh, uh, a queue hold is, is one that can be used if, if you have a job that's queued, but you, you need to make a change maybe, or you need to fix a script, or you need to maybe fix your dis, a disk quota issue. Uh, and, instead of deleting that job and, and erasing all of that precious score that you've accumulated, uh, you, you can hold the job, put the job on hold with queue hold, fix whatever the issue that it is that you may have to resolve, and then you can then queue release the job to then have the job uh, retain its place in the queue with its, the score that it was at before it was at, went on hold. Um, and so uh, specifically for QSUB, there, there are a few more options. And so uh, the, the, these options are, are specifying uh, the, the resources that you're requesting for the particular job. Uh, uh, the, the project that the job should be charged against, dash capital A, the name of the project. And so for the workshop, there's a, a comp per workshop uh, project that, that people can use. To, or if you have a, an active project on the machine, you, you, could, you, know, you would be referencing that project. Uh, you can specify the queue that you'd like to submit your job to with the dash Q argument. And a, that'll be one of the queues that we have on the slides that are rotating uh, for the particular reservation that we have in place for the workshop. Uh, the maximum mall time available that you'd like to submit the job against, uh, the number of nodes that you're requesting for the job, dash N. Uh, some output files that are generated by COBOL, you can specify the, the prefix of those jobs with dash O. Uh, I'll, I'll say a few more words about those at a later slide. Um, if, if you'd like email notifications uh, on when your job is starting and, and the status of when it finishes, uh, you can use dash M and then provide an email address. Uh, I, I find this one particularly helpful if I'm, in, I, I'm debugging something and I want to submit an interactive job, but it doesn't start right away. I can use the dash M to flag to, you know, when that interactive job starts to, to get pinged by an email. So then I can immediately start making use of that job. Instead of realizing I submitted an interactive job a couple of hours ago and it's already come and gone. Um, and so to then submit interactive jobs, you could use the dash I um, argument, or you could spell it out with dash dash interactive. So for, you, you've gone through uh, all of the, the, the COBOL syntax and you know exactly how you want to submit your job and so now here's the task of actually submitting the job to the queue. And, and again, with, with data, the, the, the primary mechanism for doing so is with uh, script jobs, is submitting a script that, that contains all of the logic for your job. Uh, and so in this simple example, the, the myscript.sh file is, is an executable file uh, and it, it has the, the uh, shell preamble uh, a couple of lines specifying COBOL arguments. And so with the pound COBOL at the top of the file, you can then specify all of the Q sub arguments from the previous slide. And so within the script, you can contain all of these settings. And so I, I find this particularly hand, handy for reproducibility, that I can easily reproduce a run that I may have ran months ago by, by containing, uh, put, putting all these details inside of the script. So again, uh, dash A with the project name, the, the dash T for the runtime, dash N for the number of nodes, uh, dash O if, if I want the, the output files that Cobalt's generated to be named something uh, specifically, uh, and dash Q for the, the, the Q that I like to specify. Uh, the, the second Cobalt command is specifying the memory mode. And so this was the, 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 the memory modes, uh, cache and flat and hybrid, for example, that I had mentioned a few slides back. Uh, I, I, I would strongly encourage to, to always specify a memory mode in, in your submit script. Uh, I, I do believe the default is cache quad, but it's always good to have this explicitly stated in your script so that you always know, you know, when you come back to your data a few months from now, that, oh, I did run that application in that particular job in cache quad mode. Um, uh, and, then, and then after that, you can then have the rest of the logic for, for submitting the job. In this case, there, there's a simple echo command to print, you know, the starting the COBOL job script, and then the app run command. And so the app run command is, is the key mechanism for, for submitting, for executing jobs on the compute nodes. Uh, before that, for example, the echo command will be executed on a, a mom node. And so once your job is submitted, uh, that job gets routed onto a mob node when it's allocated to compute resources. The mob node will process the, the commands in this script. For example, the mom node will execute the echo command. The mom node will execute the app run command. 
But when it hits that app run command, it will then schedule the, the, ex, the application to, onto the compute nodes. Um, so the app run command has, has a number of arguments. The, the main page is pretty good for the, just going into detail. We have a lot of detail as well on the ALCF websites. Um, you can specify the total number of MPI ranks for, for the application with dash lowercase n, uh, in this case 1,024. Uh, you can specify the number of MPI ranks per node with dash capital N. For uh, affinity, there's a couple of ways to control it, but in, in this example, I'm specifying, I, I'm, I'm letting app run control the affinity for the application. So using dash D1 and dash J1, which I'll explain on a, a slide or two, and dash dash CC deft. So the, the, the combination of those three arguments to say that I want app run to control my process affinity. Um, and then after that, I have the, the application that I'm running and then the application arguments uh, for, for my app. And then because everything is self-contained within the script, when I want to submit my job to the queue, I, I just need to do Q sub and then the name of the script. And again, it's important to make sure that the script is executable, that the user executable bit is set. If, if you see errors along the lines of, you know, that, that script is not executable, uh, that, that's, that's what the issue is. And so a change mode U plus X on that script will, will fix that one for you. Um, and so uh, this is going into a little more detail on the arguments that are available for app run. Uh, I, I think these are maybe the common ones that, that'll be used by, by everyone in the room. But again, I would look at the man page and the, the AOCF website for, for the full set of, of arguments. Uh, again, uh, the, the total number of MPI ranks for the application dash little n, the number of MPI ranks per node dash capital N, uh, the number of hyper threads per MPI rank, that, that's referred to as the depth in, in the Cray lingo. So you can think of this as the total number of hyper threads, whether they're being accessed by software or not, as encompassing the, 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 the depth of an MPI rank. Uh, I'll, I'll go through a couple of examples in, uh, soon. Uh, the number of hyper threads per core is specified by dash J. And so you could specify either having one, hyper, one hardware thread active, two or, or four uh, hardware threads active. And so the combination of dash J and dash D will specify how many hardware threads are active on the node and how many of those hardware threads are allocated to an MPI rank. Uh, and then, it, then with something like OMP num threads, uh, you, you could then have all of those hardware threads uh, be used for, by the application or, or a subset of those threads be used by the application. Uh, you can then, uh, again, uh, letting app run control the affinity is it would be controlled by the dash dash cc depth. So that just, again, says, you know, use the arguments of dash d to, to control the affinity. Um, environment variables can be specified with dash uh, lowercase e and then the environment variable that you want to set. Um, core specialization, uh, you can be specified with dash r and then the number of hardware threads. So this will shift off uh, certain OS processes, uh, MPI processes, off to the higher uh, indexed threads. To, and this has the effect of, of, of reducing variability uh, on, on, at the per node level. And so if, if at a per node level, your, your particular application, you notice uh, some variability that, that is not expected from your application, you could try dash R uh, and see if that has a positive effect at uh, reducing the variability. Um, and so if, if again, uh, if, if you're letting app run control the affinity, uh, a very handy environment variable would be the OMP num threads. And so how many threads, uh, is, software threads, will, each, will the application use for each MPI rank? Uh, if you would prefer to not have app run control the affinity, and, and maybe, maybe the uh, a library you're using it has its own mechanism for, for setting up the affinity on a node, you could then use CC none and then follow that with, uh, for example, the KMP affinity environment variable, um, where you don't want the app run to control the affinity. You want uh, some other mechanism to do so. And so, I, again, a lot of detail is available on the man page and also the ALCF websites. Um, so uh, uh, a couple of quick examples. Uh, so the, the first example is maybe uh, what uh, an MPI-only application may, may first try on the machine where, you, you, again, the, the each theta node has 64 cores, and so maybe a, a good starting point is to, to run a, a single MPI rank on each of those cores. Um, and so in this example, it, it's a, a two-node job uh, running 64 ranks on each node, and so 128 ranks total across the two nodes. 
uh, using one hardware thread per rank and one rank per core. And so that, though that maps into the, the app run settings that are listed there. And so the thing I'd like to point out is that, again, that, um, you know, the, the theta can on those, they have that there's 32 tiles, logically. And the 32 tiles are sharing the, the, the L2 cache. And each of those tiles has two cores. And again, each core has the four hardware threads. And, and so pictorially, that's what, what's trying to be represented with, with these different boxes. And so with the app run settings here, where we're spacing out MPI ranks on an individual hardware thread across individual cores, you can see that the MPI ranks are, are labeled out as 0, 1, all the way up to, to 63. Um, and there's a, a, a simple affinity example in the, the exercises later on where you're, you could explore different app run settings and, and to ensure that the affinity that you're specifying is what, what you're getting out. Um, now, uh, a slightly, it's still simple, but a slightly more complex example would be maybe something that an OpenMP uh, parallelized application would try as a starting point. Uh, in this case, uh, again, it's a, a two-node job. We're, we're running 32 ranks per node, and so each uh, running a single MPI rank per tile, and then having four hardware threads uh, for each MPI rank. In this case, the four hardware threads are spread across the tile using two of the hardware threads per core instead of, say, uh, using four of hardware threads per core. Maybe there's, there's too much conflict between those threads, and so it's better to have two of hardware threads per core running. Um, and so in this example, dash a little in again for 64, 32 ranks per node, two nodes, 64 MPI ranks total. Uh, dash capital N, 32, the 32 ranks uh, running within a single node. Dash D, 4, that I want for every four hyper threads that are active, I, I want to assign uh, an MPI rank. And, and then dash J2 is setting the number of hyper threads per core that are active. Um, so maybe a, a good way to think about this is maybe in the reverse direction. When I, so when I'm thinking of how to set affinities, I, I usually start with dash J, you know, how many hyper threads do I want active per core, and then go on to dash D, you know, where, where do I want to place my MPI ranks? You know, how many of those hyper threads apart do I want the MPI ranks? And then the, the dash capital N and dash N, you know, those, those follow naturally from how, however uh, I'm setting up the job. Uh, and then in this case, with, with four hardware threads are active, I'm going to utilize all four of those hardware threads for an MPI rank, and so I set open MP num threads to equal to four. Um, if, if I would have instead set OMP num threads equal to two, then for the first MPI rank, uh, it would have been only uh, hardware threads zero and one that would have been active. And so that, that would have been one example of getting a, an affinity like that. Um, are there any questions on this part? For MPI rank zero, what are the threads? So that is uh, zero, 64, one, and 65. So the the hardware threads are are, lay, are numbered uh, sequentially per core, and so in the the top left quadrant will be zero to 63, and then in the upper right quadrant will be the next set of 64 to 127, and then all the way up to the full 256 threads. Where does it specify for rank zero that the threads will be in the same tile? In, in the, the way that I've set up the affinity, right, all the threads will be in the same tile. Um, if instead of dash D4, I would have said dash D8, then that would have assigned the first eight threads across the first two tiles to the first MPI rank. And then uh, the OMP num threads, if I remember, would have said, do I want to use the full set of eight or some subset? And the, that number of threads between each MPI rank is specified by dash D, which in, in this case is four. So the, the darker blue boxes are hardware threads that are active. The, uh, what is that, teal? The, the teal uh, hardware threads, those, those are where the MPI ranks are placed. And so the spacing between the TO boxes, the MPI ranks, is the specified by dash D. You do have full control over where you want to, to affinitize the threads. And so uh, in those, in, maybe in that example, you maybe want to specify uh, an explicit list of how to map the, the software threads to, to the hardware threads. 
The depth is the, the number of hardware threads that are active between each MPI rank. So the CC depth argument is letting app run know that, that you want to use dash D to control the affinity, that you want all, all of the threads uh, sequentially indexed, and that the, the depth, uh, say a depth of four, will specify where the MPI ranks are going. If, if you don't use CC depth, you, for example, you, if you use CC none, then you can use other mechanisms to control the affinity. So, for example, you could use KMP affinity with Intel to, to specify the affinity like you would maybe on another resource that doesn't use the, the app run command. I don't know if it's a, a, a wrapper around MPI run, but you can think of it as that, that's the mechanism for, for placing your executable onto the compute nodes. It has the same functionality. So you could run a non-MPI application through App Run. Uh, I, I've run serial. You could run serial tests, for example. Um, you could you could uh, run simple tests if you were debugging an issue with App Run. Um, so if if you look, uh, so in, in some of the examples, uh, the I, I believe the, the the there's Python examples that that may or may not have MPI in them. But you could imagine having a Python script that does not have MPI, and you could use App Run to launch that script onto the compute node. Is Jupyter integrated with the scheduler? I don't think it is, no. I, I, I think a workflow for Jupyter would be that you could use Jupyter to submit a job to the queue. Are there any other questions? You don't want to use all of the hardware threads that you allocate when you're using core specialization. So there, there, there do need to be some idle cores available. And then you could then choose how many. Uh, I, I think uh, one is, is good enough in many cases. So thread, hardware thread 255 would, would be task for that assignment. So as long as thread 255 is idle, not being used by the application, it would be able, it'd be accessible, it would be usable by core specialization. So the core specialization and the specification of the memory mode, those, those are separate orthogonal settings. I, I would definitely recommend compiling on the login node. Uh, the, the, the login node, I, I forget what Xeon it is, but, but um, for, for a serial, pro, for a process-like compilation, the, the Xeon can perform better. Um, but, but depending on your workflow or, or depending on maybe the, the CMake build and the tests that have to be built as part of the build process, there, there could be cases where you would want to do that command on uh, that compilation on the compute node. Good questions. Good start to the workshop. And so uh, again, uh, to, uh, for Confinity, you can use, have app run control that with dash D and dash dash CC depth, uh, or you could have uh, some other mechanism control the affinity for you. So KMP and OpenMP environment variables are likely candidates. Uh, again, core specialization to offload certain OS and, and MPI processes to unused hardware threads. And really, this would be uh, a key thing to look at if you notice uh, per run, uh, per node variability. That, that, that um, is, is something that you'd want to investigate further and try to reduce. Um, for allocating memory in flat mode, and so if, 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 say, for example, your application has a small enough footprint to fit within the high bandwidth memory, or you are engineering your application to make use of both types of memory, uh, you, when, when allocating the memory in flat mode, uh, you can specify the default uh, allocation. You could use NUMA control dash M1 to prefer allocation out of the high bandwidth memory. Uh, and so that, that would be one example of, you know, for a small footprint application out of the high bandwidth memory, you would want to use that setting. Uh, or you could have it uh, prefer allocation out of the high bandwidth memory. And if, if that 16 gigabytes was fully utilized, you, you would then spill out allocations into the DDR. Um, and, and an example of where to place the NUMA control would be, is shown on the bottom. And you, you would place it right in front of the, the app exam, the, the name of your application that you're running. Um, once your job is queued, uh, you know, one of the first things you'd want to do is you could run queue stat to make sure that the job is, was successfully queued. Um, you would, Q sub would have returned an error message if it didn't, but you, you know, you could still look at the output from Q stat. There, there's a rich set of information that's available. Um, I, I tend to not like the default uh, that, that for the, the columns that, that QStat provides. And so I, I show here an example that it is, if, if, if you don't like the, the default output that's printed, you could set, uh, specify dash dash header and then provide a list of the columns that you'd want. Uh, and you could look at the, the man page or, or the default output to see which columns there are. 
Um, and so uh, with queue set, you can see the number of jobs are queued, some jobs are running. You can look at the queue that the job is currently sitting in. And so for the purpose of the workshop, if, if you submit your queue job to the, de to the default queue on accident and you're, you notice that your job's not running yet, because other jobs in the default queue have higher priority, you could then use the queue move command to, to move your job out of the default queue in, into the, the reservation that we have available. Uh, with queue stat, the, the, there is a handful of arguments that you can use to, to extract additional information. Uh, uh, if you want additional job details for uh, the job ID that you have queued, uh, there's a short version and a long version. You can look at all jobs. By, by default, all jobs on the system that are queued are, are reported. If you only want to look at the jobs that you've submitted, you can use the dash U argument. If you want to look at information about the queues, you can use dash capital Q. Um, again, if you want to remove your job from the queue, you can use the queued del command. Um, and all three of the properties of the job. And so a common uh, case would be maybe you want to change the wall time of a job. Um, and so I find this one particularly useful if I'm in a, working through a debugging issue and I see that some nodes are idle, but, but those nodes are being drained for a, another big job that's sitting at the top of the queue. And so I could use queue alter to reduce the wall time for my job so that it, sits, so that it runs ahead of time in, in those idle nodes and do my debugging there. Um, if you wanted to queue alter the number of nodes, you could use dash n, and again, you could use queue move to change the queue. Um, if, if you're not on the system, maybe you're, you're in the airport or, or you're, you're somewhere traveling, or you just you want to use a, a, have a, a handy web interface, you could use the you could check the status of the of jobs on the machine or, or status of the machine um, at, at this website uh, status.alcf.anl.gov/status/activity. Give you a current snapshot of everything that's running on the system. Uh, if you could look at uh, jobs that are in the starting phase, and so if, if jobs request a memory mode, for example, cache quad, flat quad, that the uh, a block of nodes are not currently booted in, then those nodes have to be rebooted for your job to be started in the correct memory mode. And so jobs that are doing that process are, can be are, are found under the starting category. Um, uh, jobs that are queued in the system and any reservations that are active on the system. And so if, if you would look at the status page today, you would see a, a handful of uh, uh, reservations for this performance workshop. Um, and in a couple of minutes, you'll probably see a, oh, actually right now the reservation should be active. Um, a handful of, of output files generated by Cobalt. Uh, and again, this was, these, these are the file names that you can control the naming of with dash capital O. Uh, so when you submit the job, a, a Cobalt log file is generated. And so this has some information of the job that was submitted. Uh, it also will, as the time the job runs, will contain additional information that, that can be helpful for debugging purposes and reporting issues. Uh, uh, when the job is allocated a set of resources on the machine and begins to actually run, you'll then notice uh, uh, an error file and an output file are created. And so these contain respectively the standard error and standard output generated by your job. Uh, and so th these are three very important files to keep around if, if you're debugging issues and you need assistance with something. Because th th these do contain a lot of information, uh, especially about the environment. Um, and so the, the queues on this system, uh, 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 by default, uh, jobs are, are routed to the default queue, uh, the primary queue on the, queue on the system. Uh, if, if the memory mode that you're requesting uh, is different than the memory mode that's booted onto the nodes, then, then those nodes will need to be rebooted. Uh, again, this is why I, I, specif I encourage you to know, always specify the, the memory mode that you're requesting so that you always know what memory mode was in that particular job. But for, for cases where those nodes have to reboot, th this can take, uh, depending on you know, the, the total time required for the tries, it could take up around 30 minutes. And so uh, I, we, we encourage you that if, if, if you submit a job and you notice that it's in the starting state and that it, it seems to be sitting there for, for seven or eight minutes, don't delete it. That, that, that's what's happening is that the, the, the nodes are being rebooted for the correct memory mode that you've requested. Uh, and and r probably after 15 or so minutes, you, you should see the job go from the starting state to the, the running state. Uh, uh, the wall clock limits in, in the default queue are a function of the number of nodes requested. So we, we are a leadership computing facility, and we very much encourage full machine jobs. We, we love full machine jobs. 
Uh, and so the current uh, queue policy is set up that the maximum mall time accessible to a job increases with, with the number of nodes. Uh, the, the, full poly, the full set of, of, of wall times and node uh, tiers are, are on the website. I, I show a couple of the key cases here that for the, the minimum allocation is 128 nodes that can run for a maximum of three hours. So again, if, if you're doing the debugging runs, maybe a, a quick 64 node job, that, that would run with, uh, with, uh, within this limit or with this, with this limit, and, and you would still be allocated that full 128 nodes. Uh, for jobs that are running on more than 802 nodes of, of the system, you, you, your job will get access to a full 24-hour wall time if, if, if your workflow needs that. Um, and for, for the earlier question, uh, there, there are a couple of 16-node debug queues available on the system. Th these are nodes that are, pri that are booted specifically in, in a single node, uh, cache quad and flat quad. And the, the memory mode doesn't change for those modes to, to help allow faster turnaround with debugging. Uh, if, if you do need a, a different memory mode for, for the work that you're doing, you can then request that in the, in the default queue. Um, again, jobs smaller than 128 nodes will be allocated a full set of 128 nodes, and so it's really important to, to maximize use of those for, for your workflows. Uh, so I, we, we encourage consider an ensemble jobs uh, where maybe you have multiple 32 node jobs within a single script, and so you could have four or more app runs listed in there. Uh, depending on the nature of your workflow, maybe a tool like Balsam would, would be very helpful to, to make use of. And so that will be a talk, I think, tomorrow afternoon. Um, uh, for, for long sequences of jobs, may, maybe you have a, a, a single simulation that needs to run for, for many, many days. Uh, with, with the current queuing policy, that would require checkpointing every 12, say, 24 hours if it was a full machine job. So we really encourage the, the use of uh, job dependencies. To, to submit all of the jobs at once, to use job dependencies to chain the jobs sequentially, and then that, that, that serves a very handy mechanism to getting through the queue faster. As, as subsequent jobs will inherit score from jobs that are ahead of it success, that successfully run. Um, so that was a, 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 an overview of the theta environment. Uh, I, I, can ask, I can answer any questions now or I can push through the, the other quick sections that I have. I'll go through this very quickly, but again, slides are available in the workshop, and you can feel free to ask questions afterwards. Um, uh, Coolies are our data analysis cluster visualization resource, uh, an x86 machine with GPUs, uh, 126 nodes. Uh, each node has a, a couple of Haswell cores, uh, so K, uh, NVIDIA, Tesla K80 GPUs, and so th there's a good amount of GPU memory and, and CPU memory on the machine uh, for, for your data analysis and visualization needs. Uh, from Cooley, uh, you, you can get access to uh, both the, the GPS file system that, that Mira sits on and, and also the Luster file system that Theta sits on. And so you could do, uh, 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 for example, a simulation on Theta, have all of the output sitting in the Luster file system, and then from Cooley, uh, access that data without moving it and, and do your data and visualization on that there as one workflow. Um, uh, a, a key difference for, for setting up the environment, uh, if for, for users of Mira, you know, you'll, you'll be very familiar with this. Uh, uh, Cooley uses soft environment instead of modules, and so you could use the soft environment command to see a, a list of all available keys on the system, uh, all available options for you know, MPI libraries and compilers, for example. Python is another example. The, the keys for your particular login shell can be modified with the .soft.cooley file that's in your home directory. So here's just a simple example. Uh, a key thing, though, is that in the .soft files, you really want the very last thing in your file to be the at default symbol, and that all of your specifications for the keys would, would be above that. Uh, and then after you, you make the edits to your .soft Cooley file, you can then type resoft to refresh the environment to, to, uh, to be what you've specified. Or, or you could log out and back in. Um, so that, that's less efficient. Uh, uh, a number of compilers are available on Cooley, the uh, GNU, Intel, and Clang, along with uh, Nvapich and the Mpish libraries for MPI. Uh, for, for an ex here's an example of a, a simple job script. And so in this case on Cooley, uh, MPI run is being used to, to, to launch the job onto the compute nodes. And so in this example, uh, it's using the Cobalt node file to count how many nodes the job has been allocated to, uh, running 12 MPI ranks per proc. 
and then the an MPI run command with those with that information to launch the executable. Uh, and so again, uh, in this case, you, you could you specify the arguments on the command line with Q sub, and so Q sub dash Q, the, the default Q, uh, on five nodes for 10 minutes against your project. Uh, on Cooley, uh, th th there are a handful of different types of queues that are available. Uh, most, by default, jobs will again go into the default queue. Uh, you, for short, small test jobs, there, there's a debug compute queue available. Uh, if, if your application needs network visibility outside of this, the, the center, you can use the PubNet queue. Uh, maybe you need to grab a database from a home institution and, and access it there. Uh, for, for GPU heavy workloads, there, there are the NoX11 queues. If, if you want to suppress the, the X server, for, uh, maybe you're, you're doing a, an intense CUDA application for processing your data. Um, and, and again, there's a similar status page for Cooley as well. And then I have a couple slides uh, at the end that I'll leave these for, for your viewing pleasure. Uh, but just to say that there are, there are a number of, of, of good things to do to figure out, you know, why your job hasn't started or, or if your job has started but it's crashed, you know, debugging core files, using debuggers on the system, uh, you know. Uh, and then, you know, again, you know, you know, for most machines, uh, all machines, you know, the, the core files are available that you can use to help debug. You know, saving the files that are generated by COBOL uh, you know, retaining important information, you know, the, the job IDs where you're experiencing the issue, what machine you are running on, uh, where the files were located, that can be very helpful because maybe one project directory has ex expired quota, whereas the project directory that's currently active wasn't being utilized, uh, and, and the exact error message. So a, a lot of this information is valuable to quickly getting help and assistance. And uh, again, I mean, uh, you know, contact ALC of support if you have any issues. If, if you know a colleague in the facility or if, if you need to just send general support, you can contact us at support at ALCF.NL.gov. You can call us in the help desk if you're having issues. You know, really, you know, anything from login issues to, you know, comp compilation issues to job submission issues to, you know, I have this massive workflow. How do I get it efficiently through the queue? Or I want to do this neat thing. You know, how, how, do, I, how do I go about doing this on, on a system like Theta? And so we are really here to help it. And, to, to answer any issues that, that um, to address any issues that may be going on. Um, and with that, uh, sorry for going over, but lots of great questions.